Right, so here we go. The Cosmos. For all of human history, mankind has been fascinated by the mysteries of the heavens and what lay beyond the thin blue veil of our atmosphere. Now, in an age of modern science and technology, many of these questions have been answered, but to this day there continues to be several unsolved conundrums. Join me, Endar, as we embark on a fantastic journey to the edge of the solar system, as we uncover the mysteries of our own cosmic backyard. We begin our journey in orbit of our home planet, Earth. A treasure trove of familiar and unfamiliar wonder in a sea of stars. Over billions of years, the dynamics of our solar system have created unique conditions for the appearance of something extraordinary. Life. On Earth, the biotic factors of living organisms and the abiotic factors of mighty mountains and plate tectonics have each played their part in shifting the course of history for the entire planet. Some of the biggest changes to our planet can demonstrate the power of life on Earth. Two billion years ago, the sudden appearance of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria caused a rapid increase of atmospheric oxygen, which was poisonous to most organisms at the time. This oxygen catastrophe, as it is known today, caused a mass extinction, wiping out most of the species of single-celled organisms that inhabited the oceans. It also started to oxidize dissolved iron in the sea, turning the whole world's oceans red for a time. The remains of this period can be seen in deep layers of rock as banded iron formations, which are nowadays mined for iron ore. But this didn't stop life, it only helped it grow. Oxygen levels continued to rise, and because the organisms that were vulnerable to it had been poisoned, only species that could withstand oxygen could live to reproduce even evolving to use it to provide energy through aerobic respiration, natural selection in action. 500 million years ago, a sudden burst of evolution gave rise to complex, multicellular creatures, and throughout many more millions of years, fantastic creatures emerged. During the Carboniferous period 300 million years ago, there was so much oxygen available that the insects grew to giant sizes as they could respire so easily. After the age of the dinosaurs, mammals took the front seat of evolution and dominated the planet, some of whom developing remarkable features such as opposable thumbs and sizable brains, the ancestors of humans. Today we have transcended evolution with our modern medicine and technology, but it's important to remember how special life here is on Earth and that we have a responsibility to protect it. Soon, you will see how terrifyingly inhospitable the rest of the universe is. We set off on our adventure. Our first stop is a short hop away, our own moon. We're by no means the first here. The footprints left by Neil Armstrong during the first lunar landings in 1969 are still imprinted into the moon dust to this day. That's because the moon's barely noticeable exosphere is so thin there's no wind here. Nothing to blow the dust around to scatter it. From here the Earth already looks small as it spins in the dark sky. It doesn't rise or set like the sun because the moon is tidally locked to it, meaning only one side ever faces our home planet. That's why we're so familiar with the appearance of our own moon and our unknown sky. But it also begs the question, what does the far side look like? Thanks to surveys, we have the so-called dark side of the moon extensively mapped, revealing many more impact craters, scars left by meteorite collisions, compared to on the near side. Remarkably, the moon even takes meteorites instead of us, so that the Earth remains safe. Without our moon, tides wouldn't happen, and the Earth's wobble on its axis would be so out of control, leading to unstable weather. We've already got much information about the moon, so let's not stay for too long. Our journey to the edge of the solar system will first take us inwards past planet Venus. Named after the Roman goddess of love, Venus hardly shows any of these qualities. If hell itself was a planet, it would be Venus. As we descend, the atmosphere appears somewhat familiar with towering clouds reminiscent of storms on Earth. However, these are no water clouds. Thick clouds of sulfuric acid cover the whole surface. The ship's instrument indicates that the external temperature and pressure are rising rapidly, quickly going well over one Earth atmosphere, two, three. You should know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that traps thermal energy in the atmosphere, 
So when I tell you that Venus's thick atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, you could probably infer as to what's happened here. Due to this and its close proximity to the Sun, Venus is home to an extreme runaway greenhouse effect, with surface temperatures of around 475 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. It's times like these that I'm glad I invested in unobtainium hull plating. We've landed on the surface. I wouldn't get out if I were you. Even if you could survive the extreme heat, you'd instantly be crushed by the immense atmospheric pressure that's 95 times greater than Earth, equivalent to skinny dipping one kilometre deep in Earth's oceans. Whilst Venus itself is four and a half billion years old, its surface only appears to be half a billion years old, indicating that a catastrophic volcanic resurfacing event took place 500 million years ago, completely repaving the old surface with basaltic lava. Venus remains an incredibly volcanic world. Speaking of lava, there's some heading right for us. So let's move on, shall we? <laughs> if one planet lives up to its namesake, it's Mercury, named after the messenger of the Roman gods. The quickest planet, Mercury takes only 88 days to complete a year due to its close proximity to the Sun. Here, the temperature ranges are phenomenal. With no atmosphere to circulate thermal energy, the day side of the planet reaches temperatures up to 420 degrees Celsius from the intense heat of the nearby sun, whilst the night side can be as cold as minus 170 degrees Celsius in the dark shadow of the smallest planet. Aside from this iron-rich core, there isn't much to do around here since it's so inhospitable. We better swing around the sun to start our journey outwards. Here we reach possibly the most extreme part of our voyage, the Sun. On our journey to its edge we must first understand the centre of our solar system, our own star. At its core, immense gravitational pressure fuses hydrogen into helium, releasing astronomical amounts of energy that balances with gravity, preventing the core from collapsing into itself. Photons travel through the maze of the stellar envelope for millions of years as they are continually scattered by the radiated zone's hydrogen plasma before eventually being emitted as light from the sun's photosphere. Bows of plasma rise from the star, contained inside of incredibly strong magnetic fields, and these prominences sometimes break, ejecting masses of charged particles from the sun's corona. We will ride the solar wind out, past the hottest worlds of the solar system and beyond. Thankfully, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from this radiation, redirecting it away from the planet or to the poles, where it shimmers against the atmosphere in beautiful aurorae. But for another planet, this luxury does not exist. Planet Mars, the fourth planet from the Sun and the first beyond Earth, is believed to have once been a beautiful ocean world, with running rivers and even the potential for life. Nowadays, it is nothing more than a small, lonely, desert world, with iron oxide dust covering the entire planet and giving it its famous red colour. Millions of years ago, when life was only starting to evolve on Earth, the magnetic field protecting the Martian paradise diminished, subjecting the atmosphere to deadly solar wind which slowly swept the gases into outer space. Any remaining water boiled away, with only trace amounts of water ice found in certain parts of the planet nowadays. The atmosphere is almost 50 times thinner than Earth's, and contains mostly carbon dioxide, making breathing impossible and sound quiet and muffled. Despite being named after the Roman god of war, don't expect an invasion by Martians anytime soon. However, the great achievement of NASA's Ingenuity helicopter showed that powered flight is indeed possible on this unbreathable world, demonstrating that with enough effort, we can overcome these problems. In fact, here in the future, we already have. If I wasn't on such a tight schedule, I'd show you the Olympus Mons Mountain Resort, but oh well, we can climb the highest volcano in the solar system another time. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Merely captured asteroids, these potato-shaped moons are tiny, and are only bright dots in the Martian night sky. It's predicted that millions of years in the future, the closest moon Phobos will stray too close and be ripped apart by tidal forces from the red planet, turning it into a beautiful, shimmering ring around planet Mars.
travelling beyond Mars, we might have a slight navigational hazard. Well, maybe not. The asteroid belt is nothing like you see in the movies. Those depictions are much more reminiscent of a planetary ring system. Shepherded by the powerful gravity of Jupiter, there are billions of asteroids ranging in size from tiny specks of dust to countryside space rocks, and even one failed world, the dwarf planet of Ceres. However, from here the nearest neighbour will be no more than a speck in the sky, indistinguishable from the field of stars without longer periods of observation to see their movement. The asteroids are believed to be the remains of the protoplanetary disk where the planets formed billions of years ago while the sun was still young. Some are rich in precious metals, making them an optimum site for future mining if the technology can be developed and cost lowered. Oh wait, this is the future, isn't it? Hey, would you look at the radar? Seems like these space pirates want all the platinum. We better get out of here. Well, moving onwards, we come across more asteroids? We are out of the asteroid belt, how come? Oh, we're 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit. These must be the Trojans. Fancy schmancy gravitational shenanigans between the powerful masses of Jupiter and the Sun create five semi-stable points in empty space that an object can just chill around without falling. These are known as the Lagrange points, labelled L1 to L5, the latter of which we are currently located at. Here, rogue asteroids collect, creating small asteroid clusters known as Trojans, preceding and trailing Jupiter in its orbit. Earth has similar albeit weaker points too, with two permanent asteroids detected so far. However, the L1 and L2 points are used by many spacecraft, including the James Webb Space Telescope, as they can be positioned safely away from Earth and interference from its atmosphere for more detailed observation. We better catch up with Jupiter now though. <laughs> 